Aloha. My name is Winston Welch, and this is a special edition of Out and About, a show where we explore a variety of topics, people, organizations, events that fuel our uh, rich lives here in Hawaii and around the world. And uh, as a disclaimer, this show is just uh, from my brain and the folks that come on and not associated with any organization that I might be. That said, I am delighted today to have Kit. And Kit, we have known each other a number of years uh, already. And uh, now it seems like suddenly we're a decade older or maybe more. And um, I'm happy to have you on the show today. <laughs> You've had a really interesting journey since I first met you. And yeah. um, so today, you know, we entitled the show Heal Yourself, Heal the World. And it's sort of just talking about Shambhala Tibetan Buddhist uh, meditation. So can you tell us, um, what is Shambhala? What does that mean? What, what is Tibetan Buddhist meditation and how would that differ? Or is that a, a part of Buddhist meditation or a sect or, or how would you describe it? Well, Shambhala is a sect of Tibetan Buddhism and it was, uh, hmm, uh, its history is 2,500 years old. The king of Shambhala, uh, Dawa Zongpo, uh, had gone down to India, met the Buddha, and said, is there a, something you can give me that I can take back to my city, which is called Shambhala, uh, because there's great strife and negativity and killing and whatnot, but we don't want to become monks. <laughs> so, so the Buddha gave him the teachings that come out of Shambhala Buddhism something that's secular and can be uh, practiced in our daily lives out in the world. So it's a very practical meditation, like you said, for those people who don't necessarily want to become monks or, or nuns and steep themselves entirely in the, uh, in the traditions. Indeed. But yeah, I mean, if you want to become a monk, you're welcome to. We do have that within Shambhala. But most practitioners are in the world. They have full jobs and lives and relationships and families. They want to keep that. Okay. And, and, and would, when we think of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, are we thinking of Shambhala? Are they synonymous in our minds, or, or, or would you say, or is that not true? I think Shambhala is more of a, a modern Tibetan uh, Buddhist sect uh, brought over by uh, one of the high lamas of the Kagyu lineage of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, he came to the United States or eventually uh, landed in the United States and started his practice here in 1969, where I was in Vermont for five years at Karmic Cholin. And uh, it quickly spread over the 18 years he lived past them. He created a worldwide organization of Tibetan Buddhism that, uh, Buddhism that uh, really spoke to Westerners. It was able to translate some of the more esoteric uh, terminology and ideas into how the Western mind could understand it. That, that's so important because a lot of the times I know these teachings are so rich and so um, important for us and ancient, and yet uh, they may be couched in a, in a way that we're not used to receiving the information, so it doesn't get translated, if you will, um, into our way of thinking you have spent a lot of time on this uh, just so people can get a frame of reference and if they want more information uh, i wanted to get your website out there right away uh, we'll repeat it later what is that it's hoikaha.org that's h-o-i-k-a-h-a.org okay and uh people can get there and, and learn about uh, some things and uh, about what your teachings are, what your, maybe your philosophy, your approach to things. And you do have a class coming up uh, or a course, I guess, starting. And when is that going to be? That's now going to be on the 15th of August on Saturday for an hour and a half. It's an introduction to the path of meditation that leads to lead living aloha. There's a very interesting and uncanny uh, relationship between Tibetan Buddhism culture and the Hawaiian culture, um, many similarities that I could go into for days, but uh, uh, aloha is what the aim of Tibetan med uh, meditation is, to get to that point of uh, experiencing it and trying to align with it and live from that point. 
What, what does aloha mean to you? It is the consciousness, intelligence, and life force energy of all existence. Okay. <laughs> Only that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is uh, actually uh, supported by many of the uh, Native Hawaiian kupuna, uh, the keepers of the secret, like um, Ilahi Paki, Morna Simeona, uh, Antina Malviri. They all spoke of this way of life that the ancient Hawaiians had and I actually experienced it up until uh, the late 60s that people were living from this place of being in alignment with nature and with the underlying uh, life force energy of it. And, and so you are local Howley, right? Is that yeah. true or did you? I was not born here. I was born in LA. You uh, were? Okay, yeah. You're so you're so uh, uh, you know familiar to Hawaii. I feel like you've been here all your life. Maybe you had a, a past life here or something. Right? I have no doubt, actually. But uh, when my parents moved here, I things were familiar. You know, the the language was familiar. The music was familiar. Uh, you know, the the energy of the land was familiar, and I took to the culture like water. And I was very uh, lucky, actually, where we lived when we first moved was in Kailua on Oma'o Street. And uh, there was an older uh, uh, couple down the block whose children, grandchildren, moved to the mainland, which was very unusual. But they didn't. They adopted me. You know, they didn't have anybody to grandparent with. <laughs> so you had some local Hanai grandparents. And they just shared everything with me. They, you know, they saw that I didn't have any friends. I was a mainland Howley boy and no local friends yet in the school. And so they taught me uh, about the culture and about a local. Oh, oh, what a lucky and wonderful experience that that was for you. And, and how old were you when you moved here? Nine. Nine. Okay. So you, it, it's, this is, this is it. Okay. And were you, uh, were your parents Buddhists or how did you come to find this tradition? No, my parents uh, would describe, have described themselves as metaphysical. They didn't want to believe in any one thing. Uh, and actually, <laughs> they deliberately left it up to me to find my own path. And what did I do at age 16 but convert to Catholicism? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay college, I, I realized I had a wonderful uh, teacher at uh, UH at, uh, who taught religion 101, which you would never probably see again. But um, And he spoke of his travels around the world and experiencing different belief systems and religions and joining them and whatnot. And I actually followed his example. And I ended up at Buddhism. Buddhism always sort of rose at uh, head throughout that path, but as we were talking earlier, I couldn't understand a thing. You know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the translation of Tibetan or Chinese or Japanese or Buddhist uh, uh, texts was awful, <laughs> you know, and I couldn't do the math, the three of these and the four of those and the eight of these. It didn't make any sense until I, I read Chokin Trump or Chick. And, and um, can you say his name again for us? Chogyam Trunkpa. How you, and how do you spell this? That, uh, C H O G Y A M is his first name. Trunkpa, T R U N G P A. Oh, and Rinpoche. Uh, uh, I think most people know that. I, well, what do they say? The, uh, when the student is ready, the master will appear. Oh, I, I read my very first book that I read about had been on my bookshelf for years, and it almost literally dropped into my hands. <laughs> and I said, okay, I need something green. And I read it, and I thought, how oh, this is very interesting. And so I picked up another book. <laughs> that first one was called uh, Life of the Buddha, or The Heart of the Buddha. And the second one I read was uh, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. No light text, but the words that were in that book had been running through my mind for years. 
And I thought, okay, this guy's my teacher. I need to find him. And I read the back of the book. Of course, he's dead. <laughs> so, but uh, he mentions Shambhala. And so I followed the breadcrumbs to Shambhala. The rest is history. That's so interesting. And you hear that so often is that uh, people who had it on their bookshelf for years or they're walking in the bookstore and it literally falls on their heads you know and this is this is not an unusual thing i think it's it's just meant to be so and, and probably as you have been in this searching and your parents were metaphysically inclined so they were open and and certainly opened your you know whatever worked for you but you probably found a lot of um uh strengths in in the different traditions you've studied that are similar of course throughout everything and have woven a, a rich tapestry with uh, having the background that you've had um, you know when you were describing what the the king of shambhala did when he went down and talked to the buddha kind of sounded like today a little bit um you know people were in strife they're killing each other if not physically metaphysically or in their hearts and um, you know, and yet they got to go home and, 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 and work and figure it all out. And we live in a very complex society, uh, but humans are humans and they've been about the same for the last, I don't know, maybe forever. Um, so this, these traditions, are they just as relevant or more relevant today than they were before? Just about the same? I mean, have, have we evolved at all as a species? <laughs> Well, this time was actually predicted <clears throat> 2,500 years ago, and uh, they call it the dark times. Uh, this is through the Shambhala teachings that we uh, received this. And the uh, practices and the teachings that Dawa Sangpo received from the Buddha uh, are the practices that are meant for this very time right now. And uh, it's very interesting, uh, you know, what the world is going through. And especially uh, right now with this pandemic, we are thrust into a time where all of a sudden we've been worked into this addiction of distraction and, you know, fill my time and being busy and all of that stuff and keeping the kids going. And the brakes are put on and we're in the middle of complete emptiness and, you know, not knowing what's going to happen. And so this, this time is the perfect time to actually start to look within ourselves. And that's what the, practice, the teachings uh, guide us to do, is to, to look inward. To look inward, to find the answers, to deal with the inward and the outward? Well, yeah. And so we're looking inward. We're creating a new, <clears throat> a new habit, let's say, of uh, being quiet, being able to drop into a quiet, silent uh, place in our minds within the midst of chaos, that we're uh, strengthening our minds using meditation to actually hold that place and while chaos is happening. And then we start to look at ourselves. What are some of the habits that I'm on, you know, automatically going through or things I'm saying to people, uh, you know, things I'm doing? that no longer serve me or these other people. And so we start to look at that and then we have a choice. You know, that, that habitual pattern no longer serves me. And I have many friends, especially now with Black Lives Matter, with many friends who are saying, you know, I'm, I, I'm a good person, I love everybody, but I hear these things come out of my mouth and it is not uh, very nice but they don't have any way to actually go in and deal with that. Or, uh, and I find for myself that this Shambhala meditation practice is the way to actually go in and change our habitual patterns. And so it, it allows us the space to have some more reflection. Um, we create a space for that. So freeing those patterns does create space, and then it creates this connection with the greater uh, consciousness, intelligence, in a life. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I remember when I we were chatting once, and I said something like, "Oh, well, meditation allows us to um, 
escape reality or something and you said no it's it's not that at all it's, it allows us to uh to be with reality to be very with reality and um i thought that was uh yeah it was like oh, of course yes thank you i you know uh, we're gonna do a, a, a meditation here uh, and i one thing i appreciated when when i've sat on your meditations before is that you um you know, you know, the mind is going to wander like that is you're not punished for the mind wandering. It is one. It's going to wander. And it's just sort of bringing back your attention. And you do that in a very gentle and uh, wonderful way. But just before we do that, can we still stay engaged in the world? I mean, there's so much going on and there's so much noise and busyness. Can we still be aware of the um, injustices or outrages or or um, maybe even the, the more mundane, can we still do that and have an active uh, meditative practice and be, can we be in the world and of the world at the same time? Uh, yeah. Or do we have to really just go to the mountain and sit in the cave? Uh, or can we, be, can we be an active practicing, contemplative, um, meditating uh, Buddhist or even without a label and still be active? With the Shambhala uh, training and the Shambhala <clears throat> levels of uh, meditation techniques, yes. And again, this is what was given to Dawa Sampo for that very purpose. Other meditation or other uh, Buddhist lineages, it really is applicable to uh, going in a cave or a uh, solitary retreat. And, uh, but this is all about being in the midst of chaos in strengthening our mind to be ground grounded in uh, peaceful abiding, essentially, and being able to respond better to the world that actually exists around us in a more centered and balanced way. Yeah, uh, it's 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 very practical because you don't have to go in the cave. Although I do recommend you know the pasta meditation if you can get away for a week or ten days, by all means, uh, do it. It's a wonderful amazing experience that you'll not regret um but this is it's it's a different it's a different form and i love this um why don't you lead us in a a meditation here and um i'll ask you to keep track of the time so we have a couple minutes at the end so uh that we can uh leave people with some some hope and some aloha and then and also uh to please remind them of uh of the class that you have coming up and where they can find that again very good. So this is a seated meditation, just as you are, Winston. I will speak to you and everybody who is watching. And um, we're in an upright position. And we don't want to be uh, leaning against anything. We want to be forward and self-upright. Uh, uh, and our hands are flat like this on our thighs. And we're in this posture of that of uh, a monarch on their throne or a, a respected warrior. So there's this sense of being uplifted and everything is relaxed and our eyes are open. And if we just gaze out at the horizon and allow our eyes to drop to the floor about four feet out in front of us, and we're inviting all the sense perceptions into this meditation. So feel yourself completely in this posture, feeling the warmth and weight of your hands on your thighs, feeling your butt in the chair, your feet on the floor, Maybe feeling the quality of the air on your skin. And just notice in this posture, your body breathing. What does that feel like? You might feel your chest and belly rise and fall. air moving through your nasal passageways and esophagus. 
You might even feel your lungs taking in and expelling air. Just notice and feel the body breathing. Now become aware of just the out-breath. Follow the out-breath as it comes out from the lungs, warm air traveling through your esophagus, sinuses, and nasal passageways. And imagine it exiting the body, flowing out, and dissolving into the space around you. On the in-breath, check your posture. Make sure you haven't slumped over or fallen asleep. And on the out-breath, following and feeling the breath, feeling it exit the body, dissolve into space. In breath, check your posture. And on the out breath, completely identify with the out breath. Be the breath flowing out and dissolve into space. You might hear something or see something in your peripheral vision that will spark mind to label it and categorize it and make up a story about it. And then it'll take you on some other story about it and then a completely unrelated story and another storyline and all of a sudden you're not even here. When you notice that happening, Simply acknowledge it by saying to yourself, thinking, and come back to the out-breath, feeling it, following it, blowing out, and dissolving into space. On the in-breath, check your posture. Just keep returning to the out-breath, relaxing outward. Thoughts and emotions can seem very solid. You might take the attitude that they're more like clouds on an open sky. Acknowledge them by saying to yourself, thinking, and let them dissolve right back into the sky. We're just sitting here, breathing, regarding thoughts as clouds on a vast open sky. So in this technique, which was very short, uh, we're not trying to get rid of thoughts 
or distractions or chaos. That would be impossible. Rather, we're seeing their transparency than returning to feel the outbreath over and over again. The outbreath is our aim during this meditation. So uh, by returning to the outbreath uh, over and over again, it's not considered suppression. It's simply returning to where we began. Our task of following the outbreath has been rudely interrupted by thoughts and uh, interruptions. And, uh, sensory input. So we just simply keep coming back to the outbreath. And it's that well, no different than the gym. Uh, when we go to the gym, we first go, we're feeling really weak. But if we keep going back, we get stronger and stronger. And playing the piano, same thing. We don't know what we're doing at the beginning, but the more we come back to it, the stronger we get at it, the better we get at it. And the same thing is applies to meditation. The more we do it, it's recommended daily uh, for at least 10 minutes a day. This was about seven minutes. And uh, on a daily basis, we're creating a new habit. We're creating a habit that will bring peaceful abiding into our life. And we're getting closer to that place of uh, the natural resting state of the mind. Uh, which is our connection to alcohol. You know, I appreciate when you just say thinking and just labeling it as thinking and it brings you back and also mentioning it like posture. I've, you know, I found myself uh, uh, leaning forward or whatever, or just being tense and, and then realizing, oh, it's just a moment to get back in. And even a short time like that, it's amazing how the system just calms down because it's it's a willful willful desire to reduce the chatter and the noise even though we know it's going to happen but it's it's willfully just saying i'm going to try and create an intentional space here and it may only be for half of a breath or maybe just on a breath out if you can even do that but like you said baby steps uh, you said 10 minutes a day, your, your class that you're going to have coming up, it's going to be on uh, from this Saturday. What time is that going to be? Sorry, uh, the 15th. The 15th. I'm sorry, that's not Saturday. That's going to be Friday. Or... Following work. It's, maybe it's the 16th. It's a Saturday, the second Saturday of uh, uh, August, whatever that is. The second Saturday. Uh, we're looking at. I think it's going to be the 15th. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm actually, yeah, actually, that is going to be the third Saturday because oh, okay. that's the week. Yep. That's yep. So it's going to be it, but it will be Saturday. At what time is that going to take place? 9 a.m. Hawaii time. It'll go an hour and a half to 1030. And will you have a little discourse and then a meditation or what's the structure going to be? So I'll give a little background, similar to what I've done today, a little more background to the uh, history of meditation. I'll get into what is the path of meditation. I'll go into the sections so people understand what they might get into if they want to do it. And then we'll uh, have an extended version of what I did today in terms of the meditation. We'll uh, allow that to go into a silent meditation, and then there'll be Q&A discussion and uh and and where do people go again to find out more information about this my website h-o-i-k-a-h-a dot org and on there is uh, uh learn to meditate is a drop down and on, under that you'll find the calendar the link and everything is there okay and um you know this is uh it's our time together is already so very quickly passed i would like to ask you to come back on and, and share more with folks because we really need this now. Like you said, it's some dark days out there, but uh, any of these practices that can help us connect with our true nature, our aloha, and that with our, our fellow humans um, is so incredibly valuable. And I, I really appreciate the, your method and your, your, your knowledge and, how, and your willingness to share this with other people. So uh, 
Thank you, Winston, for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful to see and chat with you again. I know, I, I know. It's just we're all in our virtual world, but this too shall pass. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on Saturday and uh, joined by as many of other people that can come in and, and do what they can and take a moment for themselves to become more mindful so that they can deal with everything else that's going on in a much better better way. So uh, with that, I, I want to just thank you for being on today, Kit. And uh, Kit is a wonderful meditation teacher. Please go to his website. You'll see uh, the link in the notes below. And uh, I look forward to having you on again um, in the very near future uh, as you share with us some more um, uh, wonderful ideas and thoughts and practices. Mahalo. Thank you, Kit. And uh, thank you.